Toronto Island. Nice. I think it's a beautiful view. I was just like, yeah, all right, we're pretty. having that. Canada's CN Tower. That's where the Blue Jays play. They're practicing there now. Mm-hmm. No, 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 uh, no spectators, but the, the team's in there. All right. All right. Thanks for that, Arkansas, That's cool. Buckle up for safety. Let's have it. Mary Pearl and Rick J on sponsorship. <laughs> hey, there we go. You start there, Mary Pearl. Okay. Is there? Okay. All righty. It's like, it's hard when you're way over on one side and I'm way over on the other. Okay. Well, sponsorship. When I first came to Al-Anon back in 1977, uh, there wasn't a lot of sponsorship in Al-Anon, but you heard a lot about it in AA, open AA meetings. And so I always have been one, if I want to do something, I want to do it 150%. Do it be die on the spot. And so I said, I've got to have a sponsor too. So I began to look around. Well, there was one lady that every time I came to the meeting, she would always say, how are you doing? And she said it like she meant it. You know how people say, how are you doing? You say, fine, you go on. Well, it wasn't like that. She acted like she really meant it. And so she was such a nice lady. The only thing that was wrong with that was I was a racist and she was black. And so <laughs> that wasn't going to work very well. And uh, But the more I thought about it and the more I thought about it, I told J.D., I said, I think I'm going to ask her to be my sponsor. And he said, of all the people. And I said, I know, I know. But I really feel attracted to her for some reason. And so I went up to her and I asked her if, and I told her I was a racist. And I said, uh, would you sponsor me? She said, well, you know, in here, we're not colors. We're not races. We're not creeds. We are hearts that hurt. And a heart that hurts knows no boundary. And I knew that God had put the right person in my life. And she became the first mother I ever felt like I had. Uh, I had a horrible relationship with my mother, but I had a, a wonderful relationship with my sponsor. And uh, my sponsor this past Saturday uh, is 97, and she's been in 53 years of al -Anon. And I have been very blessed to have had her my entire time in the fellowship. Uh, I got a call one time from a lady uh, that was in AA up in Toronto that I'd known for a long time. And Mildred said to me, uh, you're coming up here to speak at a conference. And she said, there's someone here very special I want you to meet. And so who that was, was Rick. Take it, Rick. Well, thanks, Mary Pearl. It was a <clears throat> great, little bit of, great little bit of controlling on the path of our mutual friend, Mutual friend Mildred. So I just want to say hi, everybody. I'm Rick from Canada, as you know, from what what, what Yvonne did, and uh, live here in uh, just outside of Toronto. And yesterday, Mary Pearl sent me a message saying that there's a severe weather advisory there in Little Rock, and um, just to kind of keep me keep me on my toes. <laughs> and so just before we started here, I got a warning on my phone saying that there's funnel cloud sightings right here. I've never seen that in my life in where I live. So who knows how this all goes, but we do know one thing, God is in control. So if my power goes out, I'll try to use my cell phone. Let's just see how this, let's see how the whole thing goes. And thanks, Yvonne, for the invite. You know, March 28th was the first time you did this. And here it is, a worldwide fellowship. And, and there has never been, I think, anything so special as having the opportunity to, uh, to, to do this with, with, uh, with my, my blessed sponsor, my sponsor. Just absolutely amazing. Um, my, my sponsorship story is um, uh, a little longer because I, I, I'm a real, real slow learner. I, I hung around here for way too long before I, I popped the question. I, um, <clears throat> I, uh, but I want to say this before we, before we kind of go any farther is that um, our sp a sponsor is a person, and, and, and I, I love my sponsor. But sponsorship is a principle, and the principle is I can't do this by myself. And so what the sponsor is, when I meet somebody who's ahead of me, they're not above, but they're ahead. Say, basically, it's you're there, I'm here. Will you show me how you got there? And my sponsor has been unendingly free uh, and, and um, generous with sharing with me how she, how, how she got there. 
And, um, and she was very clear to tell me right in the very beginning that a sponsor is not a guy, a sponsor is a guide. I'm here, you're there. How did you get here? Take these steps. Not a therapist, not a counselor, sometimes not even a friend, but somebody, another loving member of al who's willing to kind of show you the way. But I can say when I, without a doubt that, that what's developed over the 26 years that uh, Mary Pearl has been my sponsor is it's a friend doesn't even cover it. It's blood, actually. And I, and I know there are many people that, that have had that experience. And so um, one of the things Mary Pearl told me early on was um, don't mention my name if you're out referring to sponsor. Well, that's blown to heck right here. So I'm just going to let that one go. <laughs> But the whole idea behind it then is that by, by not mentioning the word by her name, but by, men's, by just saying sponsorship, it keeps it firmly rooted in that spiritual principle of I can't do this alone. But I can assure you that my sponsor is a very real person, very loving, deep, and loved person. I, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I started, in, I'm continuously in Al-Anon since 1987, April. But in actual fact, I started in 1968. I was a boy. I was 11 years old. and My mother had been introduced to Altine through a whole variety of things and uh, wanted to start, wanted a group for her kid to go to. And so she started sponsoring an Altine group so that her son could go to that group. And uh, I just want to put in just a tiny little plug. So when we talk about sponsorship in Al-Anon, there is that thing, that very clear um, service position for us in Al in Al and I being an Alateen sponsor, sponsoring the group so that they can be there. Just kind of want to put that in there. So for many many years, my mother was actually my sponsor, and I, I don't recommend that. I don't, I don't think that that was the, the healthiest thing because a lot of the things going on, I blame my mother for a lot of the, the what was going on in the in the in the, all of the active drinking. But there was a guy I met in Alateen. His name's Jerry. Wonderful guy. I still have contact with him occasionally. I never asked him to be my sponsor, but I used him as my sponsor, which is kind of part and parcel for who I was. See, so when I'm using somebody as a sponsor, I remain in complete control. And so I can call when I want, don't call it, I do what they say, don't do what they say, because I haven't made the commitment. And uh, that, that didn't work out didn't work out too well. And I, I, I left out Al, well, he kicked me out of Alteen and I went to Al and on and, you know, really wasn't in touch with him at all. And was just kind of floating around. And then I left, I totally left Al and on. So I had been in Alateen for 11 years, um, for 10 years and used Jerry as a sponsor and never had anybody else other than my mother as a group sponsor. And when I came back <clears throat> in 1987, uh, I, I, re I ran into a guy, his name is Bob, and he, um, he offered to be my sponsor. And so yet again, I was not making that commitment. He said, hey, I'm going to take you on. So I didn't have to reach out. I didn't have to take that step that said, like Mary Pearl was saying when she talked to Dr. Lubell, will you be my sponsor? And so he was, a, he was a good guy for me for a long time. But the fact that he had offered to be my sponsor had exempted me from what I think is a very important part of sponsorship, and that is the, the asking. And so he, uh, through a variety of circumstances, he left, and, 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 that, and that, that was done. And then I was without a sponsor. And then there's this mutual friend uh, that, Mary, that Mary Pearl just talked about. Her name is Mildred, dear, dear uh, member of AA. And a close friend of mine now for thirty, almost thirty years or more, and um, she introduced me to Mary Pearl at a at a conference. We were having an Al Anon conference here in Toronto, and Mary Pearl was the Saturday night speaker. So on the Friday night, Mildred, you know, introduced me, and they said, "Hey, let's go out and we'll get some, you know, get something to eat." So we were chatting away, and I, I was loving it. And then after Mary Pearl spoke on Saturday night, I. I was totally identified with so many things she said, and I'm not a, I'm not a woman, and, and I wasn't married to a man, and alcohol, all that kind of crazy stuff, but I identified with so much of what she had to share, and this is exactly what happened. After she was finished and everybody had thanked her, she said to me, she said, hey, let's go get some more ice cream. So we went back to that restaurant. That restaurant is called Marche's, and we're walking along the, the street, like Lakeshore in, in, in Toronto, and she says this to me. 
Tell me about you. What a beautiful question. Tell me about you. So she just tried to finish telling us the story about trying to drown her husband in a bathtub. And I said, well, you know, I tried to chop up my wife's head with a hatchet on a camping trip. <clears throat> she laughed. <laughs> We bonded. I never had told, I had never uttered that to a soul in my life. But God was playing a role in this relationship. And in a couple of weeks later, um, uh, my children and I are heading off to the, the, this kind of weekend, week long retreat. And she says to me in the car, she says, have you found a sponsor yet? I said, no, I haven't. I've been asking guys. She's, and Mildred says to me, I think you have. And I go, that is just too crazy. That is too crazy. So we got to this place and every day for a week, her and I prayed together about that. And, and I wrote a letter and I asked, I was no, I was, and when you ask, you're really vulnerable. And so I literally wrote the letter, put it in a mailbox in, it was in Missouri and, and we, and we came home. And so I have, I, I have the rough copy of the letter just because I'm anal, I'm OCD. I keep stuff. So I just want to just want to read one little paragraph in my chicken scratch of the letter that I wrote. So remember, this is a man asking a woman to be his sponsor. I live in Canada. She lives in Arkansas. How does that work? So this is what I said. I said, I have no idea around the logistics of this whole thing, but I can tell you that I am willing to go to any length, fly down, phone, correspond, or do anything else you suggest that he will be my sponsor. And I had been here for 10 years in Alateen, five other years, five and a half, hanging out in Al-Anon. I left, I had come back, and I was back for seven years. And I finally, finally, had reached the point of desperation where I was willing to say, I'll do anything he asked me to do. A week later, I got her letter. And because I'm OCD, I have the letter. And that letter, interestingly, the letter I wrote was on, and today is, what's the date? Today is July the 11th. I wrote that original letter on July the 14th of 1994. Three days from now, in a chapel, in a retreat center in Lee's Summit, Missouri. And a week later, I got this back. It wasn't just a letter. It was a package. <laughs> but listen to some of the beautiful things my sponsor said to me about my request for sponsorship. Dear Rick, after reading your request for sponsorship, I too have been praying about it. I've listed all the pros and cons of taking on another long-distance pigeon. There's a word we haven't heard for a long time. I told myself I wouldn't take on any more due to the time and the amount of correspondent expense, et cetera, in doing so. And I discussed it with JD for his input. JD is Mary Pearl's husband. Having JD is sometimes like having God with skin on, and this is not the same as allowing him to be my higher power. It's allowing God to speak and touch through someone near and dear. It really comes down to this. Is it a reasonable Al-Anon request? If it is, then God will provide the time opportunity, etc. So my child, welcome to the family. And that's how that happened for me. And it took 26 years to get there. So anybody here listening, don't do what I did. Do it a little sooner. <laughs> and that was really the last nice thing she said to me for a long time. After that, she said... <laughs> She said, first of all, I want you to start over with your commitment to recovery by working through the steps again from the beginning. I'm sending a step study guide and a sheet of what I require from someone being sponsored. And I had to do stuff. I had to take action. It was no longer just about going to a meeting and chatting. And then she said this, I would like for you to have a regular check-in with me once a week for a while. I would like you to have a regular check-in with me once a week for a while. Well, that for a while that has never stopped and, not, no, and will not for us to get on the same wavelength. Therefore, and then she told me the time to call. And so we used to do our calls at midnight, my time, 11 o'clock her time. Now we do them at 10. Now we do them on Zoom. And it, uh, it was the beginning of, of doing stuff. And I 
was vulnerable and I was willing and I had met God had put in my life the <laughs> guide for me. Mayor Pro. Thank you, Rick. Um, uh, when I got his letter, uh, the reason I especially wanted to talk to JD about it was when I first, the first man I ever sponsored, there weren't any men in Al Anon in our area. And so they had to have a sponsor. And so this one guy asked me, and I said, okay, no big deal. And then as time went on, well, then there were other men in the program. And so I had quit sponsoring men because basically, you know, you think about men sponsor men and women sponsor women. But the bottom line is people sponsor people, regardless of sex, race, color, creed, what have you. And so when Rick got me, and like I say, I had enjoyed visiting with him so much, and we did seem to click right from the beginning. And I told J.D. about him when I got home. I said, I really met this really neat guy up there. And so when I got his request for sponsorship, I sat down with J.D. and I said, is there anything about this that you're not comfortable with? Because I never want there to be some uncomfortability about me and someone I sponsor. And he said, absolutely not. He says, if that's what you feel God wants you to do, then I want you to do it. And I said, okie doke. And little did I know what a commitment that was going to be for all of us, for all of us. Well, I said, like I say, I had a list of things. I had a, a sheet called what I'm willing to do as a sponsor. And it tell what I was willing to do and what I wasn't willing to do. And then there was a thing that says what I expect of the person being sponsored. In other words, when uh, you say you want me to be your sponsor, I expect you to do the things that I've listed on that sheet of paper. And uh, and then once that's done, then we have a contract, a sponsorship contract. And if either one of us doesn't fulfill our part of the contract, then it isn't working. And that's the one thing I have learned about sponsorship over the years. If it's not working for both of you, it isn't working. And either one of you can say something about it, which I have had over the years. Now, one of the things that uh, the first things that I asked Rick to do was I wanted him, like you said, to tell me a little bit about himself. And uh, when he was talking to me, <clears throat> he was telling me on one of our Monday night calls that he was in a dilemma <clears throat> because he was the, the head of the music department in his school. And he had this band and they had concerts. And he said, my mother and father are separated for umpteen years, not divorced, but separated. But he says, my father has a girlfriend. And so my mother wants me to be sure and not have her at the concert at the same time he's at the concert with his girlfriend. And I said, what? And he said, well, you know, they don't get, and I said, yeah, I can understand her not getting along with a girlfriend. Yeah, I can understand that. But I said, that is not your problem. And he said, oh, but it could be. And, and so anyway, uh, I waited a while, and then the next concert came, and he was in a dilemma again about the thing. And I said, all right, I'm your assignment. Get out of the middle of that relationship. When they call and say, when can I come, tell them either day doesn't matter just come and I said and do not try to keep them separate I said if they have to meet and have a, a deal that's their thing that's not your thing and so came the night of the concert I get a frantic phone call he says I'm hiding in the bathroom <laughs> he said my mother's outside saying traitor traitor <laughs> Because they, of course, ended up there on the same night. <clears throat> and I told him, I said, what I want you to do is tell your mother this. I love you very much, but I'm not going to be in the middle between you and dad anymore. Y'all, this is y'all's deal. It doesn't have anything to do with me. You know, I want to love both of you. You're both my parents. And so his mother was not real fond of me uh, after that. <clears throat> Because there were some other things I had her, I had him to change. Um, I said, what kind of relationship do you have with your father? And he said, uh, well, not much. And I said, why not? And he said, well, we just went our separate ways, so to speak. 
And I said, in other words, you've always been the mama's hero. And, and he said, pretty much, pretty much. That's how it goes. And I said, well, I want you to develop a relationship with your dad now. Since you're working the steps, I want you to do this. I want you to start calling him and just call and just say, hi, I'm Rick. How are you doing? And get to know your daddy. Just start a little bit at a time and get to know your daddy. Well, he did that. And uh, it was very uncomfortable at first. And I said, of course it is. It's something you haven't done. It's something new. New stuff is always uncomfortable. And uh, but he continued on. And then his daddy said to him, um, "You, I don't ever get a holiday. You're always over at your mom's. Thanksgiving, Christmas, you're always at your mom's. And, and I said, really? I said, how come? And he said, well, you know, mom. And, and I said, yeah, I know you're real close to your mom. But I said, once again, you need to have a relationship with both. I said, what's wrong with alternating? You do Thanksgiving with your dad this year and Christmas with your mom, reverse it next year, do the Thanksgiving with your mom and Christmas with your dad. And he says, oh, you don't know my mom. And I said, no, I don't know your mom. But I said, the thing about it is you have two parents. Why don't you give them both the respect and the time to do that and have that with them and alternate those holidays? And uh, he said, Okay, and so he did. And, of course, uh, Mama did not like that at all. She she wanted him to take her on Christmas Eve to Mass, and then he she wanted him to be with her on Christmas Day and be with her on Thanksgiving and the whole nine yards. And so uh, when we started that deal, of course, Mama was not thrilled with it. And a lot of times I always tell people I sponsor, if when you're working the program and your family are not really thrilled about it, you're doing something right. Because usually we've been doing quite a bunch of things wrong with the family and change is scary. It's scary for your family to see you changing because they don't know what to do with you. You know, we have a tendency to put people in little boxes when they get out of their box. We don't know what to do with them. And so that's the way it is it, when you're working the steps. You're going to be changing. You're going to be doing things differently. And uh, like I say, uh, his mother was threatened at first. But then after a while, uh, we, be we became really close friends. But during that period of time, <clears throat> uh, as Rick was working the steps, I do want to share with you how he worked the steps at the first go round. Um I told him, I said, now we can do this. You can write it down or we can do it on a tape back and forth because I had done that with a long distance sponsor. And he said, no, I, I want to do it different. I said, of course, go ahead. And so he sat in front of his computer, I guess, and he did a, it was a video camera, an old VHS video camera on a tripod. Okay. And he, and so I got to see him sitting there talking to me and answering the questions on the step study guide and it was the first time i'd ever done that with anybody and i said well how neat is that because i got to see him and why did you want me to see you i wanted you to see me because i've been hiding for so long and <clears throat> virtually my whole life <clears throat> i had been trying to be whoever i thought you wanted me to be and i had been in the in the fellowships long enough with fellowship long enough that I knew that I had not been doing what I heard other people were doing and that it was time I'd reached that time where I was willing as frightening as it might have been, but it was kind of frightening, but then it was kind of comforting. It was a, it was a strange new sensation of, of kind of knowing that I was going to record these answers to the questions that I was being asked and in mirror pro was going to see them. And, but somebody that I was, I was developing this loving relationship with, but that's why <clears throat> I wanted to expose in every way possible, and I wanted to hide nothing. And I felt that if she could see me, that would be better. And secondly, <clears throat> I had an issue with my own image. For many years, I, I, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I wouldn't go to get my hair cut and kind of chop away at what little hair I had because I couldn't sit in a barber's chair and look at myself and have somebody sit behind me and ask, how do you want to look? Or 
I was walking down the, the, in a mall and then see my reflection in a store window in a plate glass. I'd, I'd, I'd recoil away. I, I wouldn't buy clothes because I couldn't stand in front of a mirror. Whatever that was about me, I don't know, but that, that, that just, it developed. And so I just felt that it was necessary in this particular case to reveal. And it was, uh, it was a pretty powerful experience because after I recorded, I mean, this is how long ago this was. I mean, remember those old VH, VHS tape and those VHS recorders? They were really big. <clears throat> and I borrowed one from school and I put it on a tripod and I literally sat in front at my desk and said, I'm April. <laughs> I read the question and fucking sent her the video. And when she got it, she, she said, well, there you were on my TV. And I said, hey, I'm a star. <laughs> <laughs> but but the power of it was was in the response. So we kind of talk about it and about kind of my relationship to alcohol, my powerlessness, the unmanageability, uh, which is so so key to this whole thing for the Al-Anon, especially when we're all so obsessed with somebody else's drinking or or or, or just uh, just so wrapped up in my own fear. And and it was um, when we finished it. I've shared this story so many times. She said this beautiful, beautiful thing. At the time, it's probably the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. And she said, congratulations, Rick. You've done step one to the best of your ability. Move on. And there it was, right there. Because this isn't about looking in the, we look in the rearview mirror so we can go forward. This is about going forward. This is about keeping our head, we're going where the headlights are pointing. And that's what she said, move on. You may come back to revisit it, but you've done it to the best of your ability today. And, and that, for me, was the value of the structure that I was given. Because I'm, I'm, I'm really a, um, a structureless person, but when I have one, at least then I, I, I know what to, I need to know what to do. And I'm not saying that this is the only way to work the stamps, but this is the way that my sponsor told me to work them. And she was my guide. And they said, you're there, I'm here, I'm doing it. I mean, it was just... It was just that simple. There was no question, no question about that. And I'd just like to add a little bit about that. That's a really powerful story uh, about, about my mom and dad. Because the thing with my mother and father when I was a child, in the midst of very active drinking, it was an ongoing thing where my, you know, they'd, they'd talk and then they'd discuss and they'd fight, but then they'd come to the, well, we, we, we got to split up. And so inevitably when the split up conversation came, they would call me in as a child and say, we're going to split up. Who do you want to go with? And so it was a terrible place to be. And then it was like, as time went on, mom would talk to me about dad, dad would talk to me about mom. So I was firmly in the center all the time. So when we're doing the, you know, when I, in, in my, my, my profession, when I worked, um, they would have these big concerts with, because I taught music and, they would call me, and like Mary Pearl said. And so when I said to my mother, I am not going to tell you what night he's coming, she was freaking out. And literally, when I, they both showed up the same one, I, I went into the bathroom of the staff room. <laughs> my kids are lining up in the hall to go and play a concert. And I see my parents come in, and I was that upset. But what a brilliant, what a brilliant spiritual instruction for recovery my sponsor gave me. Get out of the middle. You do not have to look after your parents. Uh, it's just brilliant. And it was, you know, carried on with the, the holidays. <clears throat> it's a beautiful. And so that's kind of one of the things that I, I would encourage people to do is listen, listen to the spiritual guidance uh, from the sponsor. And Brooke, can I just say a couple of other things just about that package that you sent? Did that, or did you want to move on? So, you know, there was that letter that I read, but then there was this package. And in the, in, like I said, after she said, welcome to the family, I always joke that was the last nice thing she said. It's like, now we're getting to work. At one point she said, you're the sickest al I've ever met. I took it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Attention any way you can get it. <laughs> one of the things she told me to do right from the very, very beginning was establish a daily routine. A daily routine. Start to do something right away. And so the very first thing she said to do when you wake up in the morning, say, I do this to this very day, say out loud, <clears throat> good morning, God. It's kind of like a prayer. Start praying right away. And so I do that. I, I, I remember when I did it, I was with the third alcoholic I had chosen. 
And I woke up in the morning and I said, good morning, God. And she rolled over and said, good morning. <laughs> she loved Mary Pearl for about five minutes. And then when she, I started to do all the other stuff, it would change, change their mind. But then it was like, yeah, say a prayer. And so I, I'd pray on my knees and I'd, be, I'd talk in a mirror. And that was the video thing. I had this terrible, uh, I, I couldn't stand my own image. So I'd talk in, in the mirror and say, good morning, God. There's absolutely nothing that you and I cannot do together today. And it, it, nothing that can happen that you and I cannot handle together. And what a beautiful way to start the day. And then I do my readings. And Mary Pearl's great language should call, you know, RPM, kind of get the engine going. Read, pray, meditate. Still do that. I had a great reading in the ODAT today about what ifs. What ifs. And so we kind of do that. It, so that it just it gives me something to do. Because you know, at the end of Al Anon, well, we don't do it on Zoom. But in my home group, we'd still chant, it works if you're working. Then everybody goes home and doesn't work. It. This was about working it. And so here's something very crystal clear to do. And <clears throat> she said, what I'm willing to do as a sponsor, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to do two of them. Listen to this. Encourage the person being sponsored to understand that he, she has the family disease. That was a revelation to me. As I always blamed it on you. As always, I was affected by you. This is something I have. That was the very beginning of me really totally getting that whole thing about my manageability and why I need to work these steps. It was right there. And then it said, don't ask this person being sponsored to do something I am not doing, haven't done, or would not be willing to do. And that is so crystal, crystal clear. I'm, I'm just, I, all I'm going to share with you, I got, I'm here, you're there. How would you get there? This is what I did. I'm not going to tell you to do anything else. So I can't tell you anything else that has any kind of validity or, or oomph to it. So one time I'm down visiting, and uh, so basically it's about structure, it's about discipline and commitment. And um, I said to Mary Pearl, I said, I'd love to go see your sponsor. This was a beautiful moment. And so she called up and said, yeah, come on over. So we drive over and we're sitting in Bell's front room. And this is all around me. I'm not going to ask you to do anything I wouldn't do, haven't done, or wouldn't do if I needed to. And I watched my sponsor be sponsored. It was one of the most beautiful moments ever. Because she's like me. We're, we're in this together. She's ahead. But she's doing the same thing I'm doing. And to this very day, when I hear her say, I was talking to Lou Bell today, or you know, she sent me the picture of Lou Bell on her 97th birthday, or Lou Bell says this, it warms my heart. It's the truest sense of who we are. We pass on what those before us have given to us. And, and, and we are all the beneficiaries of that. So I just love, love, love to hear that. And then there was that way, to, that way to work the steps. And so that it was, it was like just a fantastic, fantastic thing. And the check-in call is is to this day the, the, the key element and it's an insurance call not a, not all the time is there something going on but we're always in, we're never more than seven days out of connection and now we do it on zoom and i love it even more because i get to see her so we're talking now we still talk to her like 90 minutes <laughs> it's, it's so so fantastic so that i did that's uh, what i wanted to do actually maybe just one more thing before i turn it back to you mary pearl did you want to go okay. i want to talk about long distance okay as you talked about the man versus man and woman thing. And I, and I just think that was so powerful in the letter when he said, I talked to JD and he said, this is, you know, is, is it a reasonable LR request? And then, um, because if you take a look around, even if you, if you could flip through the 22 pages that are on this, on uh, this zoom meeting right at the moment. And if you could count up the number of women and the number of men, the, it would be disproportionately large on the female side. Mm -hmm. and for women that have been in Al-Anon for a long time. And so I, I don't think it's that odd for a man to ask a woman to sponsor them, given, that the, length, given, given the, the general demographic of Al-Anon. But I think that the power of, of what she did was ask her husband if, if that was okay, because this is an emotionally intimate relationship. And I've thanked JD for that a number of times for saying yes. And in uh, the long distance thing, and everybody says, well, I remember the very first time someone in where I live said, how can you have a sponsor who lives that far away? And I said, told her what I did. You know, I call every week. We have these regular, you know, regular contacts. And the woman looked at me kind of, kind of a little embarrassed. And she said, you know, my sponsor lives around the corner and I don't talk to her once a week. 
because it's about commitment. It's about it's not about geography. It's not about gender. It's about a spiritual a commitment to spiritual growth. And if I'm willing to make that commitment, like I said in the letter, I'll go to any length. I'll do anything you ask me to do. It will work because God is in play there. But another thing happened. <clears throat> so I would get to go and visit. So instead of having a sponsor who lives close by and see them at the meeting, we'd go to a coffee. I'd fly down and live with my sponsor and her husband for four or five days. I've done that many, 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 many times. So what I got to see was a power of example of a healthy relationship with two people genuinely doing everything they can to live these principles. That was more powerful to me than I can tell you. Seeing a sober man, you know, that was a super powerful for me. I saw my sponsor as like a solid member of her home group. Yeah, make that commitment to your home group. And like I said, I witnessed that healthy relationship between her and JD. And that, that has really formed the relationship, the, the foundation for the relationship that I'm in now with my wife. Thanks. Back to you there, Mary. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Rick had some problem areas we had to work on. <laughs> Procrastination. In four letters, it's R I C K. <laughs> I, I I had never seen anyone quite ha have it developed as an art like Rick did. I remember one time he had a, a computer that came and he sat there, a new computer. Now, you know how computers change every month or two. And he sat there with it in the box, unopened for a year, staring at it. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that. that. That just blew me away. But uh, the, I noticed that on several of our check-in calls, he made comments like uh, getting to school late and what have you. And I'm going, you mean, and he said, oh, I've got this kid that starts the class without me. He said, uh, and I said, is, is that what they're paying you to do? Is that, what they're, is, that, is that what that's all about? And he said, well, no. And I said, well, you're going to get up an hour earlier. And you're going to do all this stuff an hour earlier, and you're going to get to work on time. I don't want to ever hear about you being late for work again. And I know y'all have bad weather up there, but I don't want to hear about you getting to work late again. And uh, and there were some other areas. I said um, he would tell me he was uh, it was time, and I said, "Oh, have you filed your taxes?" And he said, "Well, no." And I said, "Well, what's going on?" And he said, "Well." It started a long time ago, several years ago. He said, I started making the upstairs a, a rental and uh, I just never claimed it as a rental or anything. And I am so terrified if I fall and then put this stuff the way it is on. And I said, this is a program of rigorous honesty. What the hell do you think you're doing? I said, that's called tax evasion, my child. <laughs> you know, you go to jail for crap like that. It's not for not paying it. It's for not filing it. And I told him, I want you to take care of that. And when you call me next week, I want to know that some action has been taken. And so uh, and he, he went ahead and did. And the amazing thing was he called me. He was so excited when he called me. And he said, you know, the tax situation? I said, yes. And uh I said, how much do you have to pay? He said, I'm getting thousands back. I'm getting thousands back. And I said, oh, okay, where's my percentage? You know? That's right. <laughs> it's a joke, but nonetheless, I said, I can't believe it. And so I told him, I said, you see, when you do stuff in a timely fashion, you know, you don't have to live in that fear. You don't have to live in the fear. And, uh, it, is, and it is work. I mentioned to him after he began to get there early and he began to monitor the hall and do these other things. And he became an example, not a bad example for his students. And all of a sudden uh, the principal or assistant principal one, I forget, told him and said, no, we were getting ready to have to let you go if you couldn't get there on time. And so there it was, he, even though he'd been there for years, his procrastination was gonna cost him what he loved more than anything in the world was his music and teaching those kids. And I remember one time when he was visiting, we went to see Mr. Holland's opus. 
that movie, and it was about a music teacher. And we sat there and we held hands in that movie and we cried. That was Rick. That was Rick. He was Mr. Holland. Uh, now, not to say that uh, the sponsor here didn't make some mistakes along the way. Uh, I would go visit him. And uh, I told him when he invited me to come one summer, I said, um, uh, you don't have air conditioning. I don't go anywhere without air conditioning. I've had a heat stroke. It's life threatening for me and it's also very uncomfortable. And I said, I just, I can't do it. I went to one conference where they told me there was air conditioning and there wasn't. And I was very, very it made me very, very ill. And uh, I told him, I said, in fact, there was this one guy there. We went to this millionaire's home and he had like, you know, a hundred rooms. That's an exaggeration, but it was a huge, huge home, and he was a builder. And uh, I said to him, why did you not put air conditioning in this house? He said, well, we only need it maybe a week or two a year. And I thought, what's the matter with you? In Arkansas, if we need it 30 minutes, we're going to have air conditioning. <laughs> you just don't understand. Oh, my God. It was, it was a horrible, horrible trip. But anyway, I made a huge mistake, and I went to see him at Mother's Day. I didn't even think about it. My mother had been gone so many years, and uh, we went to see Phantom of the Opera on Mother's Day. And we had a marvelous time. He wasn't with his mother, you know. And and I, when we were talking about it later, I said, oh, my God. And so when he mentioned it to his mother, yes, she was offended. Yes, she was hurt. And that was not my intent at all when I went up. I just I just wasn't thinking. But after a while, I knew I, I had made it okay with her because uh, she invited me to dinner on one of my trips up there. And uh, low, slowly but surely, Connie and I became friends. And that was that was a wonderful thing to me, you know. Um, in fact, at one of the conferences, I can't remember it now that I spoke up there, Connie was sitting out in the front, and I was able to thank her publicly, a formal thank you for sharing her son with us, because by this time, we've been together many years, and Rick comes to see us every New Year's Eve, uh, except a few when his mother was sick and passed and when his daddy passed. He, he comes and he starts, he starts the New Year's. <clears throat> and uh, I hope this damn virus won't screw that up. But it, God will take care of it, whichever way it is. But, you know, he was our son by choice. J.D. and I didn't have any children. And so I told him at one time there was a girl I sponsored. And I said, if I'd have had a little girl, I'd want her to be her. She's feisty. She's honorary, and she is incredibly funny. And I said, I would just love to have her as a daughter. And then I and I told him, and I said, and Rick would be my son by choice. And he became our son by choice. And Connie was glad to share him with us and because uh, she knew that we were going to love him. We were going to love him too. And that's what happened in our relationship is that we, uh, nonetheless, like he says, when I need to tell him something, I don't hesitate to <laughs> take the gloves off and uh, tell him what I think about something, you know. And uh, so then um, it was so nice because uh, there's been so many things we've been able to share together. We've gone to dinner, all of us together, his mom and his sister and, and what have you. And uh, even Mildred. She, she became part of that too, because if it hadn't have been for Mildred, you know how God puts people in your life to put other people in your life. And then there came the time when he said, guess what? I said, what? He said, you know, I love nature and I love to camp. And I think, ah, you know, that's not my thing. I don't do rustic. I'm not a pioneer person. You know, J.D.'s mother gave birth to him by herself. And cut the cord with embroidery scissors. I am not a pioneer person. There's no question about it. But he came to me and he said, you know, my dad has invited me to go on a big camping trip up in the wilderness area 
where we're going to be away from everybody else. Why don't you tell them about the camping trip, Rick? Sure, Mayor Pearl. Thanks. <clears throat> we can just uh, can, I, can I just fill in a couple of things? Okay. Just about the, the tax, the tax story. It was three years worth of taxes that I had failed to um, failed to, to put in, and I guess the same thing happens in the U.S. as in Canada. Up here, it's called Revenue Canada, and so they send out letters in brown envelopes with windows in them. I heard somebody say one time, I've never heard a good thing arrive in a brown envelope with a window. And so there would be these notices saying, you know, file your taxes. And so I was so afraid that they're going to catch me for evading this income I was getting from the rental unit I had in my house that I just kind of filed the, <laughs> filed the letters. And of course, the fear kind of got worse and worse and worse. So and finally, you know, I, I, I let that out and the assignment came, get those damn taxes done. I kind of found this accountant and, uh, you know, got everything ready, handed it in. And when he called me back, uh, I walk into the office. I was trembling. <laughs> if I smoked, I would have needed a cigarette. If I took a bag, I, I was really quite frightened. And, and I said, so how much? And, and this is what he said to me. He said, You're gonna be, they're going to be really sorry they sent you those letters. I said, what do you mean? So he went through it. He said, well, year one, uh, they owe you $4,000. <laughs> I really? Not bad. He said, year two, another $4,000. He said, this is sounding pretty good. Year three, another two. So it was $10,000 that I got back. And that's when I called Bear Pearl and said, look, I'm getting back to 10 grand. And she said, I want a finder's fee. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd think, you'd think that that would be the end of it. I did that two more times three years of taxes before finally, before finally, I, now I get them in early. But whatever that was, that procrastination thing in me is, is, is like it's in my DNA. And I just wanted to share, before I tell about the canoe story, I want to talk about something that happened in kind of in the process of working through these steps and in the revealing and in the vulnerability. And so I you know, did my fourth step and, you know, flew down and sat for two days and read out this, um, you know, this, this tome. <laughs> so again, I wanted to be fully expo exposed. And so, you know, Mayor Pearl's kind of sitting there. And at one point, one of the questions was, you know, list your fears. <laughs> so I say, well, I'm, I'm afraid of dying young. And so Mary Pearl lifts up her head and looks at me and says, too late. <laughs> <laughs> right there on the spot. And we giggle about that to this very day. But then something ultra profound happened. I was talking about some deeply disturbing things that had happened when I was growing up and they were around a sexual nature. Things happened in the midst of active drinking. It wasn't anything necessary that I had done, but it was something that I had been exposed to. And I'd never uttered it to another soul. And I did. And, and there was a lot of crying when I did that. And this is what my sponsor did. He just said, stand up. And she hugged me. And she said, I am so sorry that that happened to you. And it's like God reached in and took all of the fear and anxiety and hurt around that and just lifted it right out of me. And I've never felt it again. And I've never, I've never even had to tell anybody what what it, when I don't, I'm not going to, <laughs> what it was. <clears throat> but then as we pass it on, years later, I'm listening to a fifth step. And somebody's telling me something very similar. And so I say, hey, stand up. He's like about 6'4", I'm 5'8". I reach up <laughs> and hug him. And he's kind of having one of these, you know, heaving, snot flinging kind of cries. And I'm just saying, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Because all I did was pass on what my sponsor had done to me. And so it came time, the relationship with my dad was a big part of the inventory. And so the question was, what do you do with your dad when you see your dad? I said, well, we really don't do anything. We just kind of talk. And she said, well, why don't you start doing something together, father and son? I said, well, that's a pretty good idea. So I suggested that to my dad. And we had done camping when I was a young boy. And he and I said, well, hey dad, why don't we try a little bit of canoeing? 
So we took our one, like an overnight canoe trip and we had a really nice time. Just my dad and I, he was sober at the time. Stopped drinking when I was 18. And then we did another one where it was like two nights, three days, and that worked out really well. And so we're both have kind of cut out of the same cloth. So if one is good, two's better, like a hundred's the best. So he we said, well, hey, let's take a really wild canoe trip. So we planned a canoe trip up in the far northwest territories in Canada. It was so far up, the sun didn't shine. I mean, the sun didn't set. I mean, it was just shining all the time. And uh, we, we, we went down there, this wild whitewater river called the Nahani River in the northwest territories in Canada. So we took four airplanes to get there. The last one dropped us off in a gravel bar beside this raging whitewater river. And the guy said, 14 days that way. Now, the upper part of the river was fast moving, but no rapids. And so we had a guide. And the guide kind of showed us how to do things <clears throat> on the river that you're going to need when we got halfway down to get into this real, real wild whitewater. And one of the things we had to do was do a thing called an eddy turn. And that means because, you know, you're on the river, but you kind of got to you kind of got to get out of the boat. And when the water's moving fast down, there's some parts of the water that kind of reverse. And so you do these this set of maneuvers and then you kind of flip the canoe around 180 degrees. And you basically literally just gently float into the shore. And so the guy showed us how to do this. I'm in the front. My dad's in the back. <clears throat> and um, we, we did it a few times. Then dad's telling me the directions. And this is great. So we do it three or four times. And I now know what to do. So dad says it again, I get a thought. Hey dad, I know how to do this now. Did I say that? No, I did not. I just turned it into a resentment. And so every time we had to make an eddy turn, I thought, dad, I know how to make this. But I never said anything. So I kind of, you know how it builds? You ever had that feeling? A resentment just starts to build and build and build. Well, we're on the river, finally stopping for lunch one day tells me how to make the eddy turn and I scream at the top of my lungs, dad, I know how to make a goddamn eddy turn. And I turn around and look at him and he looks right at me and he says, I love you. I want to take the paddle and hit him in the head with it. It was insane. And at that moment, as Mary Pearl says, I got the octopus on my face. I couldn't see anything good. I couldn't see past anything else. I had my old debt book with me. There was nothing about any turns in the, in, the, in the book. Nothing. So I get home. Call Mary Pearl. How was your trip? You want to hear about my trip? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling her all about this trip. Remember the whole goal, the spiritual aim, like it says in Tradition 6, lest things divert us from our primary spiritual aim. My spiritual aim was to develop a relationship with my dad as a man, not as a boy, as a man. And so I'm on this litany. And then finally I stopped to take a breath and she jumps in, tell me something good. And I had absolutely nothing good to say. To which she replied, you mean to say that you spent 14 days on that river, most beautiful country you could ever imagine, and not one good thing happened. I said, no. <laughs> So then came an assignment. See, another one of these spiritual actions. You know, the steps are the clear actions we take. But then there's all kinds of other things we got to do. So she said, I want you to write me a list of as many good things as you can think of and tell it to me next week. So I thought about it all week, wrote it down. I get my Monday night call. I said, here's the list. I think there were six or seven things. And then go to any length. Like it says in the big book, action, action, more action, still more action is needed. Now she said, I want you to write him a letter. I said, what? She said, yes, I want you to write all of those things in a letter to your father. To which I said, do I have to mail it? <laughs> to which she said, yes, you do. And so I wrote the letter. When my dad died, I found the letter. It's terrifically moving. He still had it in the original envelope I sent it in. And so basically in the envelope, in, in the letter, I said, Dad, I want to thank you for the trip down the Nahani. He said, I want to thank you for helping me out a bit. It was a, you know, there's a price tag on it. I really appreciate the fact that you helped me with that. I said, Dad, I want to tell you how much I love seeing you tell the guide about the wildlife and about the vegetation. You knew more about the, the rock formations and the wildlife than the guide did. 
Dad, I was I was proud of you, Dad. I said, I, I said, I hope when I'm he was 64 when he, he was the same age I am now. He said, I said, when I'm 64, I said, I hope I have the physical stamina to do a trip of that nature. And then I said this. See, because in my blindness, I didn't see that. That's what happens in blindness. I said, Dad, I want to thank you for helping me down the mountain. Because you see, one of the activities we took was to climb up a mountain. And I'm afraid of heights. And so we got halfway up. It had stopped. The other guys are looking around. And I'm like terrified. Then they, after the break, they start moving up. And they say, hey, Rick, are you coming up with us? And I'm saying, I'm terrified. I'm saying, no, I think I'm, I'm going to go down. And at that moment, that moment, my dad, my adult, he was 64 years old, 40-year-old son. They say, Don, you coming up? He said, no. I said, I'm going to go down with Rick. I forgot of that. The assignment opened it up. God opened it up. And my dad kind of walked down and said, hey, son, come on down this way. Hey, son, come on down this way. And my dad and I got to the bottom, and he led me down. He didn't make fun of me. He didn't ridicule me. He didn't even speak of it. But I put that in the letter. And as I was walking up the street to put that letter in the mailbox, it's, 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 it's like God came down and sat on my shoulder and said, hey, Rick, you're doing it. You're taking the action. Your dad is going to get this letter. You're not going to have to bury this at his gravesite. You're not going to have to tuck this into his coffin. And three or four or five days later, he called me. And he had been crying. And he said, son, he said, I want to tell you. He said, I got your letter. He said, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever received in my life. He said, this is a keeper. And he said, I love you. And I said, I love you too, Dad. And so we were both crying. And of course, you know, then I call. My first call always is to my sponsor. And so I called Mary Pearl and told her what happened. And then she said this to me. She said, well, how about that? Congratulations. She said, you've made your amend to your father. My father's the alcoholic. There was a lot of violence. There was a lot of horror. There was a lot that went on. We don't need to get into that, but we all know what that's like in the midst of super active drinking. And for a while, I didn't quite know how I had made the amend. But as time has gone on, I see it in crystal clear that the amend to my father was from his son was, Dad, you are more than an alcoholic. You are not just your disease. You are a man. And I am proud of you, Dad. We weren't dismissing the alcoholism or him being an alcoholic. What I was saying was, you're a man. You're a real person. And so I was able then to appreciate some of the great things about my dad. And that relationship continued to grow, even through he started to drink again. And that was really difficult. And my sponsor say there, she said, just remember that alcoholism is cunning, powerful, baffling, and patient. It's my job to just continue to be the best son that I can be, regardless of the state of his disease. And I was able to do that with that guidance. And then he got diagnosed with cancer. And I was able to be with him right to the very, very end of his life. And when he died, <clears throat> there was nothing new to say. It was done. It was said. That's, the, for me, just the beauty. that the, the, You can't buy this. You can't make this up. This is what happens. Some of the things that have happened to me just because I've been, like I said in my letter, I'm willing to go to any length. And I, and I have, quite frankly. I've taken, I've taken those assignments. I, I just feel so grateful for that. Back to you there, Mary Pearl. Okay. Uh, what I want to share about the canoe trip, <laughs> going back to the canoe trip, was when he called me that Monday night after he'd gotten back, like he said, man, he was revved up, and his dad was this, that. My God, he wanted to videotape every damn thing. He and here he was, Mr. Know-it-all, Mr. Do-it-this, that. And he was just going on and on and on. And that's when, I, like I said, I told him, I said, no, something good's bound to have happened. Well, when he called me the next week, this was what was so damn funny. All those things he had bitched about were the things that he was glad it is like his attitude had flipped 180 degrees, and here he was. And the, the fact that his dad had made the video, he has a permanent record of that wonderful trip with his dad. And his dad did take pictures of everything. Uh, I've seen the video. <laughs>
I've seen more of Rick than I've ever wanted to see. Because <laughs> his daddy it's got so him so a real good <laughs> butt shot taking a bath out in the river. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, it's hilarious, you know. But those things that were all bad had all turned good. And I told him, I said, you have experienced sort of what I did when I took a month trip with my sister. And I love my sister. Oh, my God. My sister was my everything. And, uh, <laughs> but we had never spent so much. Now, we would spend a month together in Hawaii every three years. But I'm talking about driving in a car, going across the country. And uh, you might be over here in New Mexico and decide, well, we, we forgot we wanted to see something in Nebraska. Okay, turn and go that way. You know, we just did as the spirit led. Something you don't do with a man in the car. You know how that is, ladies. Anyway, and so uh, by the time that we got to San Francisco, many, 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 many days later, oh, I must tell you, the, the one of the funny parts, though, of the story was um, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, I'm in a convenience store, and I have on my necklace that's the Al-Anon logo. And the little girl at the checkout said, oh, are you a friend of Lois? And I said, yes, I am. And without a, a skipping a beat, my sister says, this is Mary Pearl, the world famous speaker. I thought I would die right there on the spot of embarrassment. I couldn't believe my sister said those words. My sister, who doesn't go to a meeting, who doesn't understand the concept of anonymity, she would ask me, is that one of those people? I said, you know, I can't tell you that or not. Don't ask me stuff like that. But anyway, I told her to go to the car. And we and I talked to her all the way from Wyoming to Idaho about anonymity and what she could say or couldn't say. I mean, that was probably one of the most idiotic things that happened. But by the time that we had spent all this time together in the car, when we had made it to San Francisco, we were planning on going down to Southern California and then going back home the Southern route. Uh, Dorothy said, I'm tired. I want to go home. What I should have done in retrospect was, um, put her on a plane, send her home, but I didn't. And I built up a resentment driving home because I was driving like 800 miles a day to get her home in a hurry because when she's ready to do something, she's ready to do something. And, uh, so I built up this dandy resentment, and here I was in Wyoming, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, standing in a cold, cold, blustery wind, putting gas in the car when it occurred to me she's not driven one mile. She's not pumped one gallon of gas. I was getting to that point where yet, you know, picky, 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 you know, and uh and what was she doing? Well, she'd gone into the little convenience store. She's all looking around, having a good time. And I'm out here freezing my butt off. And so we went on down. We got to uh, Colorado. And I went to see Don P. while I was there. And, oh, my God, he was such a wonderful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, that was that was helpful. But uh, Dorothy never wanted to go to Al-Anon or anything. And she didn't really feel comfortable around the al -Anon people so much because I would invite her to anything we ever did at our house and she might stay for 10 or 15 minutes and then she would leave and she called them your people. And I said, yes, they are my people. And my mother used to say to me, why do you want to be with one of those kind of people? And I said, because I'm one of those kind of people. That's why I'm with my own people. And uh, so... Anyway, as, as the, the trip went on, I got more resentful and more resentful until we got <laughs> to this one point and we were only five hours away from home and I decided I was just going to drive it. What the hell? And Dorothy said, no, I'm tired. I want to stop. I said, only five hours, Dorothy. Sleep in the car. She said, no, I want to stop. So we went into the hotel and at the desk, the guy said, what do you need? And, the, and my sister said, uh, Oh, I said, I said, we need um, one, two rooms. We need two rooms with double beds. And she said, no, we need one room with two double beds. I said, no, we need two rooms with double beds. And she said, 
no, we need one room with two double beds. And the guy's looking back and forth. And I said, we need two rooms. And I turned to my sister. I'm tired of looking at you. I'm tired of smelling of you. I'm tired of hearing you beg in the morning. And I began to do just like he did after the canoe trip. That's the reason I knew how that is. Fun things, you know, because when you get tired and angry and what have you, it blocks out all the good things for a while. That, but I, I can look back on it today. But we did get the two rooms, and I went to my room, and I called that I could miss what I had done. And I said, yes, I know. There's going to be a big amends to be made here. <laughs> and I said, but I can't do it tonight. It just won't happen tonight. But it did happen. But you know what I got to see in Rick? was to see a young guy grow up and become the man and the son to both his parents that any parent would have been glad to have. You know, I watched him take his mother to doctor's appointments where they gave her shots in her eyes. I watched him take her a situation she had with a place that hadn't healed. And uh, he took her to the doctor. She'd been fighting it for a long, long time. And he took and had a resolution and got that taken care of for his mother. I also saw what a loving caring. You know, I can remember when he called me from Florida and he said with tears in his voice, my dad's drinking again. And I said, that's okay. He's still your dad. He's still your dad. And you know, the thing of it is we can hate the disease, but for God's sake, don't hate the person who has it. You know, we don't ask to have it. But the thing about it is, when you learn and accept that alcoholism is a family disease and you have it, how can you be mad at somebody else for having the same disease that you have? You know, you didn't ask for that disease either. There you are. And once you have it, you have it. It's sort of like anything else. You know, you can't, you can't get rid of it. And there's people who try to do a lot of other things. But this, the 12 steps and strong sponsorship and the structure changed my life. And so if it can change my life, it can change your life. And the thing about it is getting a sponsor is making a commitment to your own recovery. And that's what Rick did that day. He made that, he made that commitment to his recovery and I will say he has never refused to do anything I have asked him to do he's drug his feet sometimes but he has never said I will not do that because that's not what he promised he promised he would do what I asked him to do but I watched him become a true son to both of his parents in every sense you know and then I have like I say we've been together 26 years on the 21st of this month. That's, that's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. But the, the bottom line is we couldn't have done it without working those steps together. And let me tell you, as a sponsor, I think we get far more out of the relationship than the person who's being sponsored. And I say that because we get to see the miracle. But, you know, we see it before they see it. You know, you begin to see them change before they realize and they're changing. They take the action. You don't have to want to take it. You don't have to like it. You don't have to want to do it. You don't have to feel good. You just do it. And that's what the program will give you, the discipline to do the things you need to do. But there's one thing that it makes it all come together, and that's accountability. That's what sponsorship is about. It's about accountability. He had to be accountable. He had somebody that was going to follow up and ask him, okay, what happened so and so? What did you do here? What didn't you do here? You know, those kind of things. You've got to have accountability because if you don't, you can convince yourself of anything. You will lie to yourself and believe your own bull. Unfortunately, that's part of our disease is that we have a tendency to want to fantasize how we want something to be, and pretty soon it's that way, and it wasn't that way at all. But you need someone that is right there and who's watching the whole story and that can see things that you can't see at that time. Then later you realize, after you've done the deal, after you have the reward, then you know, you know then, you can see it. 
in your own life. But you have to have somebody else point it out to you. My sponsor told me, she said, we're always going to see it before you do. You know, that's like the, the, I was in the program maybe two months and uh, I started an inventory. I didn't realize that's what it was, but it was things I hated about Ethel. And Ethel was my sponsor sponsor. <laughs> I didn't like her at all. And so every time I'd go to the meeting, I'd come home and I had a piece of paper that said things I hate about Ethel. And I was writing down things I hated about Ethel. And so then I was getting ready to go to the meeting one night. And J.D. said, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking over my list of things I hate about Ethel. Because I don't want to duplicate anything. And he said, oh, well, in AA, don't you hate it when they start like that? In AA, they tell us there's good in everybody. There's no good in Ethel. And he said, have you ever looked for any? Well, I just hate crap like that. I just hate it. And so I said, no. And he said, well, maybe you might ought to look for some. And so that, that was a challenge. So when I went to the meeting that night, Ethel was talking about being so angry with her husband. And she said, some, she said when she gets that kind of anger, she repots plants. And she says, and when she jerks them through, out by the roots and then works the ground and hungs them back, she's burying him in the ground. She's killing him and putting him back in the ground. She said, it's good therapy. So I come home and I write, Ethel likes plants. That's something good about Ethel. And so then for every meeting I went to, I was looking for something different. And I found different things I liked about Ethel. And then one night we were going to a potluck and I'm looking at both sides of my list. And I have a revelation. And I said to J.D., I know why I don't like Ethel. And he said, why? And I said, I think we're just alike. And so I went to my sponsor. And this is the first time I mentioned my list to my sponsor. <laughs> I'm showing her my list. And she said, oh, we all knew that. And I said, my God, why didn't you? She said, you couldn't have stood it. She said, I had no, she said, but anytime you take somebody's inventory like that, all you have to do is just scratch their name out and put yours at the top because we hate seeing our defects in others more than anything else. She says, when you have that, if you, you know, she says, you've got every one of those defects. And I had a hard time writing the fourth and fifth step. And uh, because back then we didn't have very much in Al-Anon, except the original blueprint for progress. And uh, I won't go into my feelings about that, but it just did not do for me what I had hoped that that step would do because that step seemed to be promising more to me than what I was getting out of it. And so um, that's because I answered the question, yes, no, who cares? Uh, I didn't have a complete sentence in anything. And um, it wasn't the things that were bothering me. And so I went over to the Serenity House and I asked Joe, I said, what do the alcoholics use? And he showed me a seven or eight page thing of what the alcoholics do. And they start with their childhood and they go on up to where but it's all directly related to drinking. But you see, I had had the advantage of studying the big book and the AA 12 and 12. And so I knew that where the word drinking, I could put thinking and I could go from there. And so I did all of those questions that he had for the alcoholic, how they would apply in my life. And that was the inventory that I took and that I did that gave me the relief I needed to do. And that's what prompted me to write the step study guide was that the people in my home group asked me if I would do the last 12 weeks of the year on the steps. And so that became my little research. And then of the questions that became our um, original step study guide. And uh, it's been revised over the years. And I have one now for people who have been through the steps many times and want to take a look at it from a different perspective and on. And, um, I think, I think it works well because it works in sponsorship because it tells you where the person your sponsor is, 
where they're at with their thinking, where they're at in their program. There's no question. And in that way, you know when you've done a step. You know when you've taken that one and you're ready to move on because each step is balanced on the previous step. And if you don't have one done, you can't go to two. A lot of people just read them and think that's working them. But that is not working the step because when I would tell him, okay, we're going to work on step one, I want him to tell me how he's applying that in his life. When he would call and check in, all right, how does, what was step one apply in your life there? I want to hear that you're actually doing the things, not just thinking about it, but what action. Because, see, all of the thinking in the world doesn't count. It's the action you take. And if you don't take it, just like him with his taxes, he never took the action it was waiting for him there all that time and he lived through three years of fear fear because of that it tortured himself unnecessarily and i think so many times that's what our defects do they they just immobilize us and that's the reason he was such a procrastinator because he was so afraid he was afraid to do anything for fear it was wrong it wasn't enough it might be this it might be that and so if you don't do anything, it felt safer to him. But and when you let when you procrastinate long enough on decisions that are made for you, and it may not be what you would like, it may not be what you want. So, you know, if you want to grow up and be an adult, you're gonna to have to learn to make your decisions. And a person that makes if I decide that I'm gonna go from here to Toronto to visit him. If I don't get my ass packed and on the way, I don't get there. And so you've got to take action. Once you make a decision, a decision without action is nothing. It's fantasy. That's all it is. It's fantasy. You think you're doing something, but you're not doing anything until you take the action. And so this was what that was one of the main things we have worked on over the years. And if you think you're ever rid of one, you're not because defects will come back. You know, and I, one thing I've noticed about defects, not only for myself, but the people I sponsor, they like to play as a game. They don't come one at a time. They come as a game. And you don't do this, then here's this, this, and this. They like to play with one another. And so one defect will call to the other defect. And pretty soon you got two or three operating there. That's the reason those steps are so important because you have to become willing again and again to give those things to God. It's stand in the way of his usefulness. And I say sometimes, well, God, you haven't removed this one. And then one day I was meditating and it was like I heard, you know, I'm leaving you as an example of people how not to be. <laughs> so that will be my use for today, I guess, you know, one of those things. But that wasn't it, you know, and it was like you pass on what you've been given. Now, my sponsor is much more gentle than I am. I needed that. I needed that. And uh, what have you. And like I say, she became the first mother that I ever had. And she helped me to build a relationship with my mother. by doing the assignments. I, I believe assignments are so vitally important because those are the actions you take which make you become different and you take the right action and then you see the result and then that makes you want to do it again and again and again and before that you're afraid to take the action and uh, she told me to, to take the right actions and i did and i was able to develop a relationship with my mother and, you know, I was in my 40s before I ever heard the words, I love you, from my mother. And it was because I did what you told me to do. That my, And then I had talked to so many of you who had been raised in alcoholism. My mother had been raised in alcoholism. Everyone in her family except her. She just didn't drink. I always felt like she needed one. But nonetheless, you know. Uh, and I've also realized too, one time I was telling Bill, I said, oh my God, I realized I was thinking like my mother the other day and she laughed and she said, you're probably just like your mother. That's the reason that you don't get along so well. And I thought about it and I thought, yeah, mama's like Ethel. That was it. That was it. It was that kind of personality and it was mine. It was mine. That was why I didn't like it myself. And so the thing about it is in sponsoring other people, you learn to change too. 
and you learn to be able to give love for fun and for free, for fun and for free, because the only investment you have is your time and your experience. But that's the greatest thing we have is our experience. And I knew that if you take the right actions, the right results will follow. And it did. And like I say, on every New Year's Eve, when, when Rick would come to Rogue City and spend time with us, and we'd go to the group meetings. And I tell you, we had laughed at our house. And laughter is so healing. So healing, you know. And and it, this couldn't have been done if we hadn't had the family disease of alcoholism. We would never have met. We would have never had that opportunity. So, you know, you can be grateful that there's an alcoholic that qualifies us. We are the lucky ones. There's people out there that don't have alcoholics. They don't have what we have, you know. They just struggle out there. But we haven't struggled. It's been a wonderful journey. And uh, when uh, Rick first met Lise, I saw her at a conference. And he had told me he was dating her and that she was in. And I said, and how old is this woman? And he told me. And I said, well, thank God. It wasn't arm candy like he was used to. And so. <laughs> I used to tease him, and I'd call that girl that he was with when I first met him, Frisky, and uh, she she was like a little a little dog that would nip at your ankles. I'm telling you, she really was. But anyway, I I told him I said I wonder about your choices sometime, and so I mentioned to him that an assignment I had for him when he and Frisky finally broke up, when he finally set her free, I said uh, I want you to go six months without a relationship or without sex. And he said, oh, and I said, yeah, yeah. I don't want your relationship to be based on sex because relationships that are based on sex go downhill from there. I said, I want you to get to know a person. I want you to become fond of person. I want you to really know that person before you do that. And so it just so happened the six months was over on New Year's Eve when he was at my house. And he was announcing to everybody, his six months were over. And I said, now we're going to talk about the next six months. <laughs> and he said, you're kidding me. I said, no, I always tell everybody you can't for a year. But I said, when I told you a year, you went to absolute cardiac arrest. And so I thought I'd give it to you. And you know, the miracle to that was after that six months, he went on for several years by his own choice, not by an assignment. And so that when he did meet this woman and uh, they started going together and what have you, uh, it was, it was different than it had been with the others. And then they had a period where they were apart. And, uh, and then when they got back together again, it was different because she had changed. He had changed, but she hadn't. And then her awakening came. And so then there was the day I got the call and said, guess what? We're going to get married. And I said, well, hot damn, it's about time. Because they'd been living together for almost two or three years at that point. And I told him, this is good. And so J.D. and I, we flew up to New York, and then we drove with some friends across the border into Canada, and we came to the wedding. You want to talk about the wedding? Sure. It's um, <clears throat> great. It's great hearing you say all those stories. I'm just lo loving hearing you talk. I didn't want you to stop. <laughs> well, we got up there no, no. for the wedding. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so, now we, we, um, <clears throat> it had been a, a long time that I had been at least on and off, but we've been 12 years uh, from the time we met until the time we we, uh, we we got married. And so I invited Mary Pearl to Judy and others to come. I, we, my wife and I invited them and uh, asked Mary Pearl to participate in the wedding. She said the grace at the, at the, um, at the banquet, but she stayed in our house. And so on, on the, uh, the night before the wedding, um, Lise's sponsor was here too. So Lise went to a hotel with her with her sponsor and Mary Pro was, it was in the house here with me and her Mary Pro and JD and me. And so the next day, the day we're going off to the church to get married, my best man shows up, my longest sponsee. That's kind of yet another thing that happens in sponsorship. Uh, I was his best man. He was my best man. 
And so we stood in the, in the foyer of our house and said a little prayer and we get in the car and there's me driving and Greg is in the passenger seat, Greg, my best man, and uh, Mary Pearl and JD are in the back seat. So we kind of have, have a marvelous uh, wedding and, and reception and all that stuff. Mary Pearl and JD hung right in to the end. And so when everything was done, we get back in the car and there's me in the driver's seat and there's my wife in the passenger seat and there's Mary Pearl and JD in the back seat. <laughs> We had a brought my sponsor home with me on our wedding night. And that's exactly the way that was meant to be. It was so beautiful that she had been with me every, every step of the way through that thing that it was just so appropriate. And then the next day, my mom and sister and dad, everybody came over. And it was a marvelous, marvelous thing. Uh, and it all started, like I said, with me writing that letter saying, I'll do anything. But leading up to that marriage, there were, there were some great things that Mary Pearl said to me. And one of them, to this day, oh, holds true. Well, a few of them do, but this one. And, and as, as we're kind of talking about handling with the money, right? That's a deal. I talked to Mary Pearl and JD about how they handle their money. And, and, and the wisdom that she gave to me was, it's not so much how you handle the money. It's that you agree on how you handle the money. That was the key. Because it wasn't really the, the exact way you implement it. It's that you agree on how you're going to implement it. And so you're going to have 10 different couples doing it 10 different ways. If all 10 are agreeing on how they're doing it, they're all doing it right because it's working for them. And so that was profound for us because when you get married later in life, that, that, that that's an issue. All of them. And so that really kind of um, helped us so much with that. But then she said to me personally, because I came from a family where um, cheapness was, a pro, was, was always there. <laughs> so she said to me, don't be cheap. And I've never forgotten that. And frequently my wife will say, you're so generous. I say, I, and I will continue to be. I want to be. And that comes from that one thing that my sponsor said to me. was, don't be cheap. Because, you know, we work the steps together. And, you know, then there's these assignments. But then, you know, there's these nuggets. These nuggets that come just kind of in the midst of things. And that was one of them. Just in general, you're just having a general conversation. And something happens. And say, wow, that's right. Here's another one. My wife has three grown children, and they, when I started dating her, her, her youngest son was 14 and, and like 17 and 19, and, and I taught high school, and I got along well with, with kids, but I didn't have any of my own children. And so I was having a bit of a time with, with my wife's kids, and so I'm talking to Mary Pearl about this. And so again, one of these nuggets that has just borne fruit. It's, it's, it's like a seed that's turned into a redwood. I mean, it's just been so powerful. And she said this, two adults wanting to get together, grown kids. She says this to me. She said, let the kids come to you. That's simple. Let the kids come to you. A good hook into a tradition there, right? Um, attraction rather than promotion. Great hook into the tradition. She said, you be who you are and let them come to you. If I had not worked those steps, I could not be who I was because I hated who I was. I was the guy that couldn't look at himself in the mirror. I'm the guy that would hide and run from everything. I'm the guy that would kind of form myself around you in any way I thought you wanted just so that I would feel that you accepted me. But I had stepped God to work in those steps. I had changed. And so I was comfortable being who I am. I was falling in love with their mother. I had nothing to do with any kind of marriage uh, split up. And the way that ha that has developed over the years is, is time for another whole share. But just, we just say that that nugget is born so much fruit um, in, in those children and then grandchildren. And I, I have no kids, but I have grandkids. How does, how does that happen? So just a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Can I share a few of these other little nuggets? Mary Pro? we chatted about Go that. ahead. Go we right ahead. About talking on Thursday. I was involved when I met Mary Pearl, I was involved in service, area service, I'm quite active. <laughs> and you know, many people say get a service sponsor and I'm not I'm get a service sponsor, I guess, but I never needed to get a service sponsor. My sponsor had kind of taken that trail before me in any kind of service job that I found myself having, she had had. So she was really able to help me uh, really clearly with all of, all of that stuff. But I'm at an assembly one time and uh, I, I was the area chairperson 
and there was somebody there who was a trustee and he kind of tapped me on the shoulder. His name was Howdy. Did you ever run into Howdy, Yvonne? Did you ever meet him? It didn't matter. And so he tapped me on the shoulder and he said to me, he said, um, you know, Rick, I said, I think you'd make a good delegate. Really? You think I'd be a good delegate? And my head just kind of like, I had to kind of hole in the sides of the door so I could get through. So I called, <laughs> so I called my, I called, you know, Mary Pearl Monday night and said, yeah, he was at the assembly, you know, my term's coming up and I'm working through my steps. So I'm not thinking. And um, I said, look, how did he tap me in the shoulder? And he said, I think he'd make a good delegate. And then I said, what do you think? And there was silence. And I'm here to tell you that if you ask your sponsor a question and there's silence, hold on because it's coming. And so after this moment of silence, she said, so a question, hey, Mary Pearl, you know, how do you uh, think I'd be a great delegate? What do you think? Silence. Then the answer, well, Rick. Don't you think your area deserves a delegate that's practiced all 12 steps? <laughs> Zing! And so the answer was, well, yeah, I think they do. And so I, I, never, I never threw my hat in that ring. Jump ahead years later. I get invited to share at a, an election assembly somewhere. It doesn't even matter where it was. I share that story just because it was an assembly. I thought it was an appropriate story to share. Everybody laughed, kind of like many of you did. After I talked, the, a delegate elected that afternoon, like five hours before, came up to me and said, I haven't practiced all 12 steps. <laughs> I said, well, it's not too late. Kind of get that. Like, there's, That's why I think it's in step 12 we carry them at. Do that. Get that stuff done. So that was just a beautiful, another beautiful, really funny, but very, very powerful thing uh, that, that she said to me. And, and when I got invited to start going to speak, I said, well, how do you do this? So she put me in touch with, she knew how to do that. Talk to this person. Here's the travel agent. Contact this person. And she said something to me really interesting. I've never shared this ever before anywhere. She said, you're a single man. I was single when I started doing it. She said, you just keep yourself clean. She said, you don't start fishing because she said, I know who you are. And that goofiness with women. See, that's why I don't sponsor women. I sponsor men. I just don't get too goofy with women. And she said, you're out there. And she said, you could, she said you just keep yourself clean. And I have. I have a Saturday night after the speaker dance happens, I go, I go to my room. I'm chatting with a woman. I'll do it in the, in the lobby, not up in any way. And that's been great, great input. And so I'm so, so, so grateful for that. And uh, I'd like to chat just a little bit about my mother. Mary Pearl talks so powerfully about the relationship with her mom. And I had a difficult one with mine, too. She, I, I kind of had, had a, as much resentment against my mother, the non-drinker, as I did against the drinker. And so I, I had a really difficult relationship with her. And when it came time to do the amends, you know, I was, I was told very specifically how to do an amend. It wasn't like I just show up and say, I'm sorry. So I'd written down my list. We'd gone through everything that I did. And what I did with my mother was I basically abandoned my mother. I ridiculed my mother in public. I made fun of her to other people. And she, she loved me beyond anything you could ask. And I just continued to, I ridiculed my mom. Couldn't see it through my blindness. When I saw that, I went and made the amend. And it's hard to make an amend to somebody who's already in program because they know what you're doing. But I was told when I make amend to do this, admit what you did wrong. And then say, what can I do to make that up to you? Make it a repair, not just an admission of guilt. So I sat with my mother at the kitchen table and I admitted, I said, mom, I, I did all this stuff. And I, I, I saw your face. I remember one time I told, in front of a whole group of people, I told her I hated her. And I saw what I did to you, mom. I said, what can I do to make that up to you? And she waited. And I held on. <laughs> and you know what my mother said to me? She said, Rick, I said, I'd like you to call me more and drop by every once in a while. All my mother wanted was a relationship with her boy. And you know what? All her son wanted was a relationship with his mother. And so that was the beginning for me and my mom. 
And so when she got sick, like I'd, you know, I'd bring her to the hospital to get this eye thing done. And it, like it was an eight hour trip for a five minute appointment. And a few times she'd say, Oh, Rick, I'm so sad. You know, so sorry to be doing this to you. And I said, mom, you're not doing this to me. I get to do this with you. And when she was in the hospital close to when she was dying, she lost her sight and she loved Alan. She'd been in Alan on 47 years when she died. And, I, and I'd read, I'd read the ODAT and I'd read the courage to change to her. And then we'd kind of chat about that together, mother and son. And when my mom died, it was that same feeling I'd had with my dad. I had been with her every step of the way. I was there right till they pushed the, I don't recommend this, but I did this. I was there right till they pushed the coffin into the, you know, to be cremated. And I was clean with my mom because they had done what these steps tell us to do. I'd taken those actions. Actions, sometimes they're uncomfortable to take, but the results are so phenomenal. And yet another, another ongoing gift of sponsorship and following the direction. And the thing about direction and sponsorship for me is it's given in love. It's not given in, in, in kind of, it's not punitive. It's not mean. It comes from a loving place. And it's done so, so much, so much for me. I think that that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm at there, Mayor Perot. I think we're, we're running out of time here. Avon, hey, we've got like maybe 15 to go. So, yeah, do, you want to, do you have a few things more to share there, Mayor Perot? I had a couple I wanted to share about sponsoring other guys. But other than that. Ed, go ahead. Yeah. I, um, like I said, I only sponsor men. And, and, and there's uh, many things that have come out of that. The initial part of that was just because how goofy I can be with women. Um, but what I can say is this, that, that that celibacy assignment that I accepted and then kind of embraced, the, the instruction that Mary Pearl said was crystal clear. She said, you need to discover that women are people, that you can have a friendship with a woman, that it's not all about sex. And I didn't know that. I always thought that that's what that was. And the third alcoholic that I've been with, Frisky, is Mary Pearl's nickname for her, was 14 years younger than me. And I did her wrong. I did her wrong. And this had to change. And so I took that, um, I, I took all that, 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 that time off and I came to really respect. And, and now I have wonderful friendships with women that are non-sexual. And my wife, when I kind of out, out and about or I'm at a meeting, my wife trusts me because she knows that I'm not out there doing that. That's just kind of one of the results of doing that. But I got get the sponsor of these guys. And one of them, his name was Jonathan. And I'd say was uh, because he, um, he died when he was 39 years old of brain cancer. And I loved that guy. And he loved me. And I never kind of had that with men before. It was really important for me to develop relationships with men and the, the sponsorship relationship that I've developed. I've developed those kind of relationships with the guys that, I, that I'm privileged, privileged to sponsor. But I remember the time, that, the day that Jonathan called me, and he'd been in a car accident. The ambulance brought him to the hospital. He was kind of in a coma for a few days. He called me. And he said, look, I've been in the hospital. He said, I had this car wreck. He said, they thought I was driving drunk. He wasn't. He said, they found out that I have a brain tumor. Test, test, test. He said, yeah. I said, I got a year or two, and that's it. So it was a whole new deal of how do you sponsor somebody who has a terminal illness? It was difficult because there were times when I just kind of wanted to dive in there with him. He didn't need that. He needed somebody to kind of be positive with him, to be kind of, you know, he, he, if I didn't get the FO from him once in a conversation, I didn't counter just like we were really had, had a good, had a good conversation. And he lived with me for a while, um, but it was hard. And I remember sometimes I'd, call, I'd talk to him, then I'd have to call my own sponsor in dealing with that. Um, but we did his we did his amends. We did his ninth step. And one of the things that he did, and he gave me permission when he was alive to tell this story. And he I, he had stolen stuff from his elementary school, all kinds of supplies. And I said, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you go to Walmart, buy yourself a shopping cart full of basketballs, go to your school, old school, and give them to the school. And he said, really? I said, yeah. He said, this is about action. Now he's dying. He said, okay, I'm going to do it. So he did. He went to Walmart, bought the basketball, showed up at the school with all these basketballs in a bag and said, hi, you know, my name is Jonathan. I went to school here many years ago. I stole many, many things from the phys ed department. I'm just trying to clean up my life. And I'm here. I'd like to make this donation of basketballs to the school. 
the secretary was just over there. She didn't know what to do. She called the phys ed teacher. The phys ed teacher came up. Jonathan said the same spiel to the phys ed teacher. The phys ed teacher said, this is amazing. I want you to come down to the gym with me. So into the gymnasium goes Jonathan with the teacher. And the teacher says, tell that story to all these kids. <laughs> and to make the event three times. And then he accepted the basketballs and he said he floated out of there. And I said, I, I said, that's your story. But I said, I'm going to relate that story. And the thing that's powerful is he was dying at the time. But he was still willing to do the deal, to reach, to find his God. And I believe he did. And I was there with him the last 15, 15 hours before he died, as sitting with him. And I believe to this day that he knew that I was there. And that's the kind of thing we start with sponsorship. The principle of you're there, I'm here. How did you get there? But then God comes in and a relationship happens and love develops. And a level of closeness and a level of intimacy unknown to me happens. And it's happened with many, many of the men that I'm grateful to sponsor. So, so happy to be able to share that. And and I'm part of a sponsorship family. Every thir you know, Now that we're on Zoom, every second Thursday, we get together with all of the all the people that my sponsor sponsors. I'm a thorn among roses, I can tell you that, in that, in, in that group. <laughs> but it's so lovely for all of us to get together. Uh, I love it uh, to, to share. And uh, my gratitude, I hope my, if my words can express my gratitude. I hope that my actions do because I'm overflowing. And I'm overflowing with the Baptist program, what this program means to me more today than it ever has all these years later. I think I, that's about all I got, Mary Pearl. How about you? Okay. Uh, I wanted to add about the sponsorship family. Uh, I was a change of life baby, and so therefore all of my siblings were either dead or married by the time I was eight years old. So uh, I didn't understand about family as such, you know, coming from, so many people say I came from a large family and I felt like an only child. And I was raised by older people who didn't run around with people with other kids. So I really didn't know how to relate to other kids a lot. And uh, so when I got in al -Anon, and like I say, uh, my sponsor became my first mother. Uh, it was like, I wasn't in there three or four months until this girl came up to me and she said, would you be my sponsor? I said, oh, what is the matter with you? I haven't been here long enough. I don't have anything to give anybody. And so I was telling my sponsor about it. And she says, well, what did she say when you said that? And she said, but you make me laugh. And I haven't laughed in years. And so my sponsor said, why don't you tell her what I tell you? Pass it on. And so you won't go wrong. Okay. So I sponsored her. And uh, my husband ended up sponsoring her husband in AA. <laughs> and with our wonderful help, in just one short year, they got divorced. <laughs> Needless to say, like everything else, she learned what works by what doesn't work. So that was one thing Janie and I learned. That we do not sponsor husband and wife. That's just not something we do. And uh, But it's been so meaningful because so many people that he sponsored and so many, I, they become like part of the family, but their family is a part of our family, but it's not the same. And uh, I, I love having the sponsorship family. And then all of a sudden, uh, WSO came out with there's no such thing as sponsorship families. And I think that's because they were uh, trying to protect people from what some people do in the program. Just remember everything you hear. If you can't pull it back to the big book or our literature, it's not, you know. And there's a lot of things there that are said and done under the name of sponsorship, which have nothing to do with sponsorship. It has to do with control. And I just wanted to make sure, because our family is there because they want to be. And I have an international family uh, because, you know, I, I sponsored a girl in Africa for many years and she's now moved to Portugal and she's having meetings there. Uh, I've sponsored people 
in Italy. I've sponsored people in Australia. I've sponsored people all over the world. And each one of them has given me so much. Like I say, you learn how to do by how not to do. And uh, I don't sponsor, like I say, I have three men that I sponsor. And two of them are named Rick. Two of them are named Rick. I said, isn't that amazing? And then I've had lots of meaningful relationships with men in my life, and they have been Ricks. Don't know why that is, but that's just a God deal. But I do love the feeling that we have a sponsorship. And when the Zoom came out, it just occurred to me one day, I said, we could have the whole family get together at one time on Zoom. It, you know, that had never. And so when we think about this virus, and yes, it caused a lot of horrible, horrible deaths and stuff. But something good comes out of something bad. If you look for it. And I said, Zoom was marvelous for those of us so that we could see each other face to face because in Arkansas right now, if we were in a regular meeting, we would have to be six foot apart at the minimum and we would have to wear a mask and we couldn't touch one another. We couldn't hug one another. And I said, for God's sake on zoom, you can see each other face to face. And that's the reason when I talk, I'm always appreciative of people who stay on camera so to speak because i don't like talking to a square that says rick on it or a square that says mary pearl i want to see your face i want to know you're there because always when i talked over the years and rick too will tell you this is the hardest kind of talk to do because we don't get rick and i are doing it now we're getting to experience back and forth but see y'all don't we don't get to hear your part coming back so it's just real difficult so please be courteous enough to let us see your face because the healing comes when you when you can look in another person's eyes and you see that face-to-face -face recovery. And so people say, well, how do you do that with the sponsorship? And I said, especially if it's out of way from where you are. And I said, it's real simple. We call one another. We talk on a regular basis. And now with the smartphones, we can send pictures back and forth, and we can also have that face-to-face -face on the phone thing. And uh, I just recently, like I say, uh, since the thing started, I got the laptop where I can do the Zoom because my computer was so old. I had a uh, power in the floor, and my screen didn't have a camera, so there was no way to do that. But now I have that ability they got by someone I sponsored. You know, they came and they said, I know you can't get out, but we left something on the front porch for you. And I looked and there was a box with a new computer a laptop in it. And like I say, I have had so many blessings from people I sponsor. And it's like, I love dogs. And I found in... Uh, Canada on the internet, a lady that raised dogs, raised poodles. And I was telling Rick, I said, she's in Ontario. She's in your, in your neck of the woods. And I said, um, I was going to come up there and visit you. And I want you to take me over there because I want to look and see her dogs. And so he did. And I picked out the two I wanted to have bred together. And so on my birthday, those babies were born. That year, and uh, so I couldn't get away to go get them when I was supposed to, because I had other commitments. And so here it was, pouring down rain, Christmas Eve. Me and a couple of girls. One was from California, and another one was from someplace else. We got in a van and we come up to get the dogs. Pouring down rain in Toronto traffic. Oh my God. I mean, it's it's just another world up there. When you're from Arkansas, you know, a four-lane highway is a big deal. And up there, they got like four feeder lanes. It must be 25 lanes. It looks like the whole world is a lane. And so uh, I called Rick. I got off of the freeway, and I called him, and I said, come lead us and led us to the home. But when those babies were born, he and Lee's drove all the way out to where the lady lived, and they took pictures videos of my babies when they were little 
And I got to have that history of my babies. Now, that's an act of love. to Go to all that trouble to help somebody. And then when we were there to get them, I told him, I said, you'll have have to lead us over and get us back to the freeway. We'll never figure it out. He took off that morning and he took us over there where we picked up our babies and brought them home. So we had, you know, I started with a, a dog, a poodle that was born in Canada. And so here it was again. And so I'm there. there's just no limit to what you can do in sponsorship and working these steps in your life. Thank you very much, Yvonne.